welcome to Protea Valley Church at home. I'm Brent, I'm one of the crew that helps lead this congregation of God's people. And it's really great that you've joined us at home watching online. Of course, we understand that you can't watch church. In fact, you can't even do church or go to church. We really believe you are to be the church. And so if at all possible, we'd love you to come join us at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. here in this building where this church meets uh, the church then gathers to sing God's praises, to listen to the scriptures read and preached, and then to go out and to be on mission together for Jesus' fame. So please uh, do connect with us, uh, connect with us either on our social media platforms or on our website, uh, proteavalleychurch.org. Uh, this is a snippet out of last Sunday. It's the teaching and preaching component of the service. We really hope that it's of service to you, that it would edify you that it would bless you, that it would equip you to go and be a Jesus follower this week. So let me pray and then let's get to the teaching. Father, Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the beauty of your word. Thank you that we can hear it read and preached to us. I pray that our hearts would be open to hear what it is you would say and that your word would transform us and change us so that we would look more like you day after day after day, Jesus. So come Holy Spirit, sharpen our hearing, and then sharpen our lives so that we might be an influence in the world for Jesus' sake. And so we ask this in his beautiful name. Amen. Let's listen to last Sunday's teaching. Amen. Morning, won't you be seated? Uh, so we love talking to each other here, um, and I would love you to talk to each other for a few moments, but you got it, like you're going to have to really put your, your thinking caps on this morning because I'm asking a really big existential question. Why are you here? And I don't mean why are you in this building this morning? Um, why are you here full stop at all? Why, like, why are you here? Talk to the person next to you. Why do you think God made you? Possibly a little bit early in the morning for big existential questions like that. There's an old catechism, the Westminster Confession of Faith, that speaks about the chief and highest end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I think at its heart, that is why we are here, to make much of Jesus and to enjoy Him, to, just to find pleasure. Marco last week helped us to find delight in the Lord. So after the four gospel books that are the accounts of Jesus' life, the New Testament is made up mostly of letters to various churches, most of them scattered around Asia Minor and Greece. Uh, they are letters mostly from Paul, some of the other disciples, and they are letters that are there for a bunch of reasons. On one hand, they're there to guide the churches, to encourage them to follow Jesus, to kind of shape their thinking about who Jesus is and who they are in light of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The letters are there to praise the churches when they've done things well, and they're also there to rebuke the churches when they get things wrong. And you don't have to read too far through those letters to see there's a good mix of both of those things. Uh, many of Paul's letters start off like, really well, you guys have done a great job, kudos. And then at other points, like, really, what were you thinking? Like, how did you get this far? And I've often wondered to myself how a letter from Paul would sound to us as a church. Paul an apostle of Jesus to the church in Protea Valley, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember, and then I've kind of been thinking over this last season as we've been celebrating some, something of the beauty of what God has done in our midst over the last 20 years. I've, I've been wondering to myself, what would Paul's letter say to us if Paul arrived at worship? I've asked this question over the last couple of weeks as well. If, if Paul arrived at worship, sat through a service, and then went back to Timothy, he'd be like, Tim, you'd never believe what I saw on Sunday morning at Prodi Valley, dude. Like, it was, like, would he say it's amazing? Or would he be like, man, these guys, it was, it was weird. Like, I, like, I've never seen worship like that before. There was this dude with this big white V thing going, and it made this like, it was like wild. Um, every congregation 
has a unique context and a distinctive part to play in the bringing of God's kingdom into the communities in which they have been planted. And so those letters are to those churches, encouraging them to make an impact in those neighborhoods and in those cities for God and for His kingdom. And I believe that the Father has a plan and a purpose for us here as a congregation in Protea Valley to influence our neighborhoods, our communities, and ultimately our city. And the communities around us are never influenced by flashing lights and electric guitars, no matter how nice they sound. They are not influenced by preachers who stand up in pulpits, no matter how well they explain the Word of God. The communities and the cities in which God's people find themselves are influenced through the simple city-influencing work of the people who follow Jesus and who make up those church communities. It's easy to forget that the church in Thessalonica, which we're going to read about today, a letter from Paul to the church in Thessalonica is in Greece, and he writes this letter to a bunch of people who, just like you and I, hold down jobs, raise families, are trying to figure out how to live lives in a crazy world. There were all sorts of pressures on them as they are on us. These were people who, in the midst of crazy circumstances and a culture that stood opposed to the Jesus message, were trying to make Jesus known to others. And it's a letter to them. And a letter to us, the people that make up the church of Jesus. And so let's listen to the first chapter of Thessalonians, Paul's letter to this church. And Candice is going to be reading it for us. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Thanks, Candice. So however the person who did the reading pronounces the names, when you continue preaching, you use the same pronunciation (laughs) because so so many of his names, we have no idea how they actually are pronounced. So thank you, Akia. We will use that one, Candice. So should Paul have written a letter to us? My hope is that it it would have something of the tone of the letter to the Thessalonian church, which, which is a, an affirmation that there is something beautiful that has happened to this church. They, they, they're doing things, and what they are doing is coming out of faith and love and hope, and they're affecting the communities around them and shaping the city in which God has called them to live. I'd hope that that letter would praise us for the things that we do because they're the things that Jesus wants us to do because he has some plan and some purpose for this church. So this end over the last weeks, we've been speaking about some of the rhythms that we want to see lived out by those who call PBC home. And so we want to see people deeply connected with Jesus, spending time with Him and growing in obedience to the Spirit. We want to see every one of us take up the mission to be a disciple who makes disciples. We want to seek the welfare of the city through radical love and care and justice and generosity and hospitality and compassion. We want every person in some midweek community that's on mission together. And we want to see our people speak boldly and with courage about a hope that lives within them so that should Paul ever get to write a letter to us, it would be a letter of encouragement and a letter of affirmation. And this is all summed up in a vision statement that will hopefully carry us into the next season of PVC's life. Over the next 20 years, we want to work towards a world where all the believers who are Protea Valley Church have a deep and authentic connection with Jesus and with each other learning together to imitate Jesus as they influence the city for his fame. Now, 
I, I love making mission statements and vision statements. And you listen to every church's one. You go, that's really awesome. And we should have one like that. And then you read another church. Oh, that's even better than the previous one. We should have one like that. Those are just words on a piece of paper. What we're hoping to see are lives that are so transformed that people would look at us and say, something has happened there that could never have happened unless there is a living God. And so Paul praises this church in Thessalonica in ways that I'd hope he'd say about us. We, we thank God, he says, for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. I, I would hope that you uphold this congregation and every person who calls at home in your prayers. And we remember before God and Father, uh, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For a, for a church to prevail in this crazy world that exists outside of God's kingdom, Jesus has to be at the center of it. A concrete is an incredible material. So if you look behind me, you can't see them so well, but on the back wall, there are these pillars that uphold this massive roof and, and they're made of concrete, but they would steel down the center of them. If they didn't have steel in them, at some point they would start cracking. But the steel reinforces these pillars so they're able to contain the incredible weight of a higher roof over our heads. And so every church needs to be plugged deeply into Jesus for it to prevail in a world that stands opposed to everything of Jesus' message. It has to be fueled by faith in Jesus, by Jesus' steadfast love, and by Jesus-centered hope in their hearts. And I would hope that if Paul would write us a letter, that he would say, I see this in you. Like you are focused on Jesus. Like he is the source of your strength. When you're doing good work, it's not because you're doing it out of guilt. You're doing it out of faith in him. When you labor, I, I hope that you're laboring, not because it's the right thing to do, but that you're laboring because you love Jesus and because you know that he first loved you. I hope that if you persevere, it's not just because you're belligerent and bloody-minded, but because your hope is in Jesus, who we know will make all things new. And it, it seems obvious, at least to me, it seems obvious that Jesus should be at the center of every church and that faith and love and hope should be the things that drive us and fuel us, right? But it also seems patently obvious to me that that is not true for every church, that there are all sorts of other forces that are at play pushing us and pressuring us. The pagan world... Uh, in which Paul writes this letter and the pagan world in which this early church lived had all sorts of pressures, just like we do, cultural pressures, pushing us to hold certain things to be good and true, even though God says something different. Uh, all sorts of pressures to temper down the Christian message, to make it softer and easier and more palatable. You know, I was talking with somebody a couple of months ago who, who comes from a very different background to most of us, same sex attracted and all of the complexities that come with us. And this person said to me, but you know, if, if you tone down your message, you'd make it much more palatable for people like me. And I said, fair enough, I agree with you. It would make it a heck of a lot easier. But I also have to preach the scriptures and teach the things that God holds to be right and honorable and true. And that may mean that it makes it uncomfortable for you. And at some point, you have to choose whether you like your sexuality more than you like Jesus. That, that is the ultimate question that every one of us has to answer about our own lives. And so these, these pressures must have been on this Thessalonian church. You know, There's this little Greek fruit dealer who heads down to the city every day with his basket of fruit to go and make his sales. There must have been pressures on him because as his mate comes and talks to him, hey, don't you want to come to my house on Saturday? And I, I can't. I'm gathering with some people. What are you guys doing? Well, I mumble, you know, like the same kind of thing you feel, same pressure. In a world where Caesar was king, to claim that Jesus was king would be death. And so for us with cancel culture and the Papuda Amendment Bill that sits with our parliament, the reality is it's going to become increasingly difficult to follow Jesus and increasingly difficult to speak the truths about Jesus and the things that Jesus taught. There are going to be cultural pressures to become simply another caring community organization and not an outpost of the kingdom of the Most High God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to serve in a community caring organization. I do want to serve in an outpost of the kingdom of the Most High God. That sounds way more exciting to me. Like, I want to be about the work that Jesus is calling me to be about. I want you to be about the work that Jesus is calling you to be about. And so over the next 20 years, there is going to be pressure on us to abandon in some way Christ. And I want Paul to be able to write a letter to us. Maybe he won't write the letter, but maybe when I get there, I run into him in heaven. And he's like, brew, like I saw what you got. Jesus showed me what you guys were doing in Prodi Valley. Wild stuff, man. That was, that was good. You loved him well. Like you loved him well. 
And so there's been pressure and the pressure will mount. We see it overseas at the moment in the last weeks. The Anglican Church in the UK has approved the blessing of same-sex marriages. It's also rewriting the prayers, the, litur- the, the liturgical prayers that will be used in worship, worship to present God as having no gender despite Jesus' clear teaching to pray our Father who is in heaven. When Jesus is no longer at the center, but rather people, Jesus' followers become people pleasers rather than God honorers. And then the church is in danger of finding rebuke. And if you go through the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, you may or may not know this, the end book of the Bible, Revelation, there are seven churches that have letters written to them. They're an interesting mix of letters. For some of these churches, like you have done so well, Like you have just done everything that God expects it of you. There are two churches in particular to whom Jesus has very little good to say. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. Awesome. This is good stuff, guys. Uh, But you're dead. That's not so cool. To the church in Laodicea, I know, that, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, and so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Paul reminds the church in another letter, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus. Like whatever people would want to say about us, I would hope they say, those guys really love Jesus. The church gets a letter from Paul that I would be proud to receive because they have built their lives on a foundation that is Jesus. And so the leaders of Prodi Valley have worked really hard over the last 20 years to ensure that Jesus remains at the center of all that we do. And we will do everything in our power to ensure that Jesus remains in that position, that it is to him alone that praise and glory and adoration is given and not to us. We want to follow his instruction and his scriptures and point people to him for he is the savior and not us. And we will help another generation of leaders into their position of leadership in the life of this church so that when we are long gone, we, we will know that what will remain here will be the name of Jesus. Marco reminded us last week that all the beautiful stuff comes out of us when it's fueled not by duty, but by delight. Everything that this Thessalonian church is doing is fueled out of what Jesus has done in them and what Jesus has done for them. They're just, they're making much of Jesus. Like, how do you guys work so hard, man, because we have faith in Jesus? How do you guys labor so consistently because we know that we have been loved by Jesus? How do you guys endure when there are these pressures against you to conform to the world and to abandon God? Well, we endure because we have hope in Jesus. And people who believe those things change the world. And there are two things, perhaps, that I want to talk about a little more clearly this morning. They had firstly imitated others who had followed Jesus well. That's how they'd learned to be that kind of a church. So here's what Paul, Silas, and Timothy write to them. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Spirit. And firstly, so they'd, they'd, they'd watched Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They'd seen something of their passion and their enthusiasm for the Lord, and they'd begun to imitate them. And I, I love this. Like when Marcus speaks last week, you listen to some of the things that Marcus has been doing over the last years. Every time he speaks, I'm like, man, I want that. Like, I want to do that. And, and I, want to, I want to yield myself to the Lord in the same way that he is able to do that. And then they themselves had become worthy of imitation. In uh, chapter one, verse seven, you talking to this church now, you you modeled it on us, you saw what God was doing in us and you wanted that, you imitated us and then you became a model to all the other believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And it's really important to note this, that Christianity is not taught, it's caught. Like we, we, in the modern church, especially in the Western church, have this idea that we can teach the objective truths of Christianity. Now, it's really important that somebody stands up and proclaims the word of God. The scriptures are really clear that we should be doing that, that someone should be devoting themselves to the public reading of scripture. It's what Paul writes to Timothy in one point. Like devote yourself, Timothy, to the public reading of scripture. It is important that in our kids' church and in our confirmation classes that we are instilling some information about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit into the lives of the people around us. Information is important, but information without formation is worthless. Now, quick show of hands. Who went to Kutka Sasi Klasso or confirmation classes? Okay. 
Keep your hands up. No, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. How many of you came out of the other side of that as Jesus followers? And the hands thought, you see, you had all the knowledge, right, about Jesus, but, but you didn't necessarily have a heart shift in this. And what, what, what is important to realize is that Christianity is caught by watching people, by modeling yourself on people, much more than it is about a head game, about information. These things cannot disciple people. I remember saying this in a sermon once, and somebody in the congregation came to me, because I said this, I said, look, I've been preaching for, I can't remember, it was about 10 years ago, five years ago maybe, and I said, I don't think I've discipled a single person from the pulpit of the church. How can you say that? You've been preaching God's word. I know I've been preaching God's word. God's word does not disciple people. It plows the ground open and puts the seeds in, but somebody's got to tend the ground. Like someone's got to water, someone's got to put compost and fertilizer down. When that vine starts coming up, someone's got to prune it, get the bugs off it so that it can grow and fruit and become everything that Jesus destined it to be. Discipling happens when people who delight in Jesus and who follow Jesus help other people delight in Jesus and follow him. So this church had seen Paul, Silas, and Timothy's passion and the Spirit's power in their lives. In Acts, there's this great story where Paul and Silas are in prison. Okay, now, like, I don't know what prisons are like in your mind. I saw a picture yesterday of a Scandinavian prison. It looks better than my bedroom. Okay, there's a bookshelf filled with books. There's a little desk side lamp. There's a nice puffy pillow. And I'm like, okay. So in my mind, I'm thinking like Polesmore Prison, which I've been to. I remember going once and doing some work with awaiting trial prisoners. Um, in this particular cell is a strong word. It was a compound-like thing. It was about probably about a third the size of this building. There were about 50 or 60 people sleeping in that area. They were sharing beds, two or sometimes three to a bed, depending on the density of people in that particular week. I think what Paul and Silas were experiencing was worse than that. And so in Acts 16, they're in prison. It's midnight. What are they doing? This bloody blanket, all these fleas, this guy's farting next to me. No, no, they are singing and worshiping Jesus. And the Thessalonian church looked at them, their passion for Jesus, and the way that they continued to labor for him, proclaiming the truth, even when they were in prison for proclaiming the truth. And that church is like, man, we want to be like them. And people are probably going, no, but you know, if you do that, you're going to go to prison. It's like, I don't mind, because I want that. They imitated Paul and Silas, saw their passion and the Spirit's power. And then, as God transformed them, something of that same passion and power began to rub off onto other people around them. 20 years ago, a couple of hundred meters up the road, a small group of believers, 14 in total, gathered in a rustic old farmhouse. And as God worked in their midst and people around them saw their passion and the Holy Spirit's power, they came to join them. And look at us now. And I have no idea what the next 20 years are going to look like, but I hope that we can look back at it and we can say that we have worked hard because of our faith in Jesus and that we have labored because we understood his love for us and that we have endured, not because we're just stubborn, but because we had hope in Christ. And I hope people, when they point fingers at us, that group that meet in that building, the music is too blim and loud. It's all about Jesus. I don't want to hear about Jesus. Uh, great, but they're hearing about Jesus. I, I want them to say that we loved the Lord well. Faith, the faith of this Thessalonian church then becomes a model to others in their affection towards Jesus. So you became a model, he writes, to all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They're two areas in modern day Greece, northern Greece. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Their faith prompted the planting of churches in those two cities in modern day Greece. The church had loved Jesus with such intensity and such passion that those churches, as they planted those churches, they looked back to their parent church and they were like, we want to be like them. And they'd seen our faith and love and hope. It compelled the Thessalonians into city-influencing faith. And they began to imitate them. And it didn't stop there because as others came to faith and saw the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, the, something of their passion and something of the spirits working in them, something of their love for Jesus, their delight in him, began to fuel them up. And the only reason that you are seated in this building right now is because every generation of people has watched a previous generation take delight in Jesus and have thought, I want that. And I long to see the next 20 years filled, saturated, 
overflowing with our love and affection for Jesus. I'm not so much interested in the stuff that we're gonna do because if we get our love for Jesus right, we will do the things that please him. Somebody once said this. It was a great line. I can't remember where I picked it up. He said, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We know that's one of the great commandments, right? And then do whatever you want to do. And his point was that if you do love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the stuff you want to do is the stuff that Jesus will want you to do, right? It's when, you don't, it's when, you, it's when you're half-hearted that you start doing stuff that you shouldn't do. And so I can tell you, just stop doing this thing and you should do this better and you should be more moral and you should be more ethical in this way and you should be like whatever. Our job in this pulpit is to point you towards Jesus and to call you to put your hope in him. Perhaps it's worth asking the question, is your life worthy of imitation? Are you able to say without arrogance as the Apostle Paul does in his letter to the church in Corinth, where he says this line, I urge you to imitate me. Anybody said that in the last year of their life? Like, you want to know how to follow Jesus? Just come watch me. Like, said nobody ever. I, I, this is a difficult one. Some of you, your lives are just not worthy of imitation. And I'm not going to tell you to change your life what I want to tell you to do is focus your attention on Jesus. Thanks for the chorus, Jenny and Paul, that we sang at the end of that last one. When we understand that he first loved us, something has to shift. So don't try harder to be a person worthy of imitation. If you're gonna try harder at anything, try harder at loving Jesus more. And then let Jesus do the change that needs to happen in your heart. Just come before him and you say to him, like, Jesus, my life is not worthy of imitating. Like I felt crushed on Sunday when Brent said, can you say to people, I urge you to imitate me and I can't say that and I wanna be able to say that, not out of arrogance. And so Jesus helped me to empty myself of me and I want more of you. There's an old chorus we used to sing. I don't think we sang it here for like 15 years at least. More love, more power, more of you in my life. Like if you realize your life is not worthy of imitation, that's your prayer. Do you get up every morning? More love, more power, more of you, Jesus. Amen. Go to work. Do whatever you want to do, right? Because he's going to shift some things. Second comment, though, I think some of you are far too hard on yourselves. Many of you are doing an incredible job of following Jesus. I listen to the passion with which you talk about Jesus. I look at the labor that you labor for him. And I see it's not done out of guilt. It's not done out of sense, some sense of earning your way into heaven. You do it simply because he has been so good to you and your lives are worthy of imitation. And my hope is that you would say to others, just come watch me. I got a couple of things right by his grace and by his grace alone. Watch me as I follow Jesus. I think we should be able to say to, to our kids and to our spouses and to our friends, we should be able to say to them, just watch me. Watch me as I, as I live by faith. And I don't get it right all the time, man, but I'm trying. Watch me as I find my identity in the love of Jesus. Watch me as I face hardship with my hope in Jesus. A Jesus-centered life is one that is worthy of imitation. And I hope you are able to say that to someone in the next while. Just watch me. Watch what a life looks like when it is touched by grace, when it understands that it is loved beyond all else. So I hope the next 20 years for us as a church are as saturated with Jesus as the last 20 were. From that small gathering in the old farmhouse who worshiped Jesus and longed to make him known in this valley, to leaders who gathered on this land. There used to be a tree stump, Charles. Where was it? Was it? No, I think it was like over here somewhere. It's like legitimately, maybe it was in the car park, but there was a tree stump quite close to the wall. Remember, you used to come up and you used to sit on that tree stump and then we would come gather with you on a Sunday morning. I think we had a nine o'clock service. We used to gather here at eight. We prayed that Jesus would give us a base in this valley from which to do mission. And look what we have. In kids' church classes and youth group gatherings, we've wanted to see a younger generation come to know the great love with which they have been loved by Jesus. We have prayed that an older generation with history and heritage in Jesus would allow the faith and hope and love that has fueled their lives to be imitated by another generation that comes beyond them. And what the next season holds, we have no idea, but we have lived fueled by faith, hope, and love 
in Christ and from Christ for 20 years, and I pray that the next 20 years would only deepen that reality. And when God calls us to do difficult things, because I'm telling you now, it's gonna get difficult. That even in the midst of severe suffering, that we would receive the word of God with joy and that we might say to him, here I am, send me, rather than leaning into comfort and safety and security. That like that Thessalonian church, we would cry out, Jesus is king, not Caesar. And may we labor in hope that the generations around us will turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. It is always and only about Jesus. Let's pray. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us. And that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.